This is Dr. Alan Blum recording on uh, July 24, 2015, talking with Andrew Chalk about uh, really the most creative phenomenon in all of the subject of cigarette smoking, which is cigarette advertising. How could we possibly imagine that uh, so many years after the Surgeon General's report of 1964, cigarette advertising would not only continue to exist but would flourish? And I want to focus on England because there was a tremendously clever uh, era in British advertisements from the late 1980s through the 1990s that uh, really w uh, enabled the advertising agencies and cigarette companies to circumvent any uh, regulations and legislation uh, that were restricting or banning cigarette advertisements. This largely came about because of the restrictions that the UK made against cigarette advertising, such as not being able to depict athletic prowess or glamour or beauty or fresh air or almost anything. As someone even remarked, even sunlight couldn't be shown. So the advertisements for the Gallagher uh, brands in particular, Silk Cut and Benson and & Hedges, I think are the most um, dynamic, exciting, creative, uh, clever advertisements I've ever seen. Now, that's only not just playing devil's advocate. I think that what we've learned all along or should have by now, as the Godfather said, never hate your enemies because it could affect your judgment. And the more I noticed these ads, the more I was just in awe of them. So in the early 1990s, I went to London to... Uh, give a talk, and I looked up one of our former residents from Baylor, Mavis Jaworski, who was doing, um, uh, I, I think, a, a medical practice there. She moved over there with her husband, and I called to see if we could have lunch, and she said, oh, yes, and by the way, I've got to show you these incredible anti-smoking ads. I said, anti-smoking ads? I've, I've, I don't think I've seen any here. She says, oh, yes, uh, let, me, let me show you. And we, when we got together, we, she looked up at a billboard, which was um, of a, well, as she said, oh, it's incredible. They've got this, this big scissors cutting through this, this uh, cloth, and, and it's got this huge warning that, that smoking is, is uh, um, don't smoke when it can harm your baby, and it, it can cause all sorts of diseases, and there are huge warning labels, and isn't that fantastic? I said, but Mavis, don't you understand what that ad is? She had not known because she's not British, that the scissors cutting through the piece of cloth was, in fact, silk, which was the cloth, being cut by a scissors. And these rebuses, or these puzzles, uh, extended for more than a decade as Silk Cut became the most creative advertising brand um, or, and brand of cigarettes uh, anywhere, so that every child would know what a Silk Cut cigarette ad looked like because it didn't look like an ad to any adult, certainly not to any adult who didn't smoke. So you'd see, for instance, a Volkswagen with a, uh, a German officer in the driver's seat, squunched in, this huge guy squunched in, and his, his helmet would be uh, pithing through the convertible top of the car. And, of course, the, the, the convertible top was made out of silk, so silk cut. And the warning would say, smoking causes fatal diseases. And, and that, in fact, that would be the only words you'd see. I think that um, uh, most of these ads didn't even show the pack. So you, you were seeing a puzzle, whether it was a, a cheese grater. There was a Wall Street Journal article that uh, was just in awe of these as well, uh, describing just a, a cheese grater and, a, and some purple confetti-like thing. And in fact, what it was was a cutting of this silk cloth with a cheese grater. And um, there were dozens and dozens of these, some that we're going to make available on the website. My favorite all-time ad was for Benson & Hedges Lights. And Lights had distinguished itself from the regulars with the light blue pack color. So the advertisement in question showed the Egyptian uh, statue of Ramses sitting on the throne. And the only thing in the ad, apart from this sort of dark shadow of Ramsey sitting on the throne, was alongside him was a roll of toilet paper in light blue. 
So it was indeed Ramses sitting on the throne. And the only words in the entire ad were, smoking when pregnant harms your baby. So to all practical purposes, uh, that's the only thing that you would see. Uh, and um, I'm sure a lot of people to this day think that these were anti-smoking ads. Another favorite was um, one for embassy that consisted uh, solely of a, um, a turtle. And um, the caption was, no unsightly pet hairs. And I, I even forget the copy, but the, uh, the ads were so clever that uh, you were just struck by these images. Perhaps the, the most cynical was one for Winston cigarettes, that the copy of which basically said that since we're not allowed to talk about Winston cigarettes, here's a stuffed aardvark. And that was the only image that you saw in the advertisement. I think that um, uh, the problem of the anti-smoking forces was that uh, we were trying to ban things and then restrict things. And uh, the classic example of that was the American Medical Association, which in 1985, I think it was, uh, passed a resolution in their House of Delegates to call for a ban on all cigarette advertisements. And then the next year, they passed another resolution to call for a ban on Joe Camel advertisements. Well, I would have thought that if you're passing a resolution calling for a ban on all cigarette advertisements, that Joe Camel series would have been included. But it just shows you how the anti-smoking forces in the health community really doesn't have a clue. Uh, their jobs don't depend on there being a decline in cigarette smoking. In fact, the more smoking there is, the more jobs there are going to be in anti-smoking. I should add, too, that Marlboro may well have been, as one would expect, the most successful uh, global brand, in part because as each country passed restrictions on cigarette advertisements, such as the first, I believe, was Norway in uh, the mid-1970s, um, both, uh, well, at that time, Camel uh, came out with a whole series of of camel boots ads. They created a line of, of uh, leather boots that they would advertise since they could not advertise camel cigarettes. And in France, uh, in, after a similar law was passed, uh, there were a whole line of camel briquet or camel cigarette lighters advertisements that were passed. But basically, Marlboro um, was establishing clothing stores with a line of Marlboro clothing throughout the world, uh, Scandinavia, the rest of Europe, um, and the Far East. And these were high-end, incredible, um, uh, expensive uh, clothing. Um, Camel also did this. And in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, it was beyond belief. One could go from the uh, Marlboro Classics clothing store to the Camel clothing store, which or Camel Adventure Store, which whatever it was called, to the Kent Holiday Travel Agency, uh, sponsored by Kent Cigarettes, to a bowling alley named after, I believe, also uh, Kent, and um, a, a jewelry store, the Benson Hedges Jewelry Shop. So th these were the ways that the cigarette companies just simply didn't skip a beat by not only renaming the stores after brand name, but literally owning uh, these brands. So they, they literally established travel agencies and bowling alley and other venues uh, that they were actually selling products and certainly at least breaking even so that they continued to, to advertise the product. And uh, in England, the Marlboro ads were also effective and creative. They showed bleak countrysides that didn't have any writing and maybe just an old tumbleweed or an old picket fence or a, a, a skull of a, of a steer. And you knew what that was, even though the only prose on the page was the very bold cigarette warning.